The Saga of the Swamp Thing, issue number 25, cover date June 1984. This issue is um, of note for a couple of things. One, this was the first issue I actually bought in the comic book store. I remember seeing this cover, seeing this, it just looked different, opened up, looked cool. So I bought it and then I ended up buying the remaining issues of the Alan Moore run. Um, didn't, knew it was cool. I didn't realize how great it was gonna be. And I didn't understand how good it would be at the test of time. This is 1984. I'm not even 20 years old yet. Also of note, this is the first issue that was edited by Karen Berger. And Karen Berger remained the editor for the rest of this run. And the first four issues, including the reboot issue and then the first three-story arc, three-issue arc, excuse me, Len Wein was the editor. And it was cool, but it was more kind of superhero-ish. This is when the book started turning into more of a horror comic. And... This is seven years before Karen Berger was the mind behind Vertigo Comics. Successful imprint that DC's abandoned. It's a shame. I know they do Black Label, but Black Label, it doesn't have the same overall quality and I think mission as Vertigo did. That's just my opinion. So anyway, let's go on with the book. So Alan Moore decides to do a cold open for this issue. Now the cold open is something that you see all the time now on TV. Um, it's usually like a show like an NCIS or Hawaii Five-0 where some scene happens, it's one or two minutes long, it doesn't involve any of the recurring characters, and then the events of that one or two minutes drives the plot for the rest of the episode. So here, Alan Moore does it, and this wasn't really done in Big Two Comics. Um, again, there's Alan Moore just writing at a different level than everybody else. So it starts off where these two men, this one guy's talking to their guy, they get off on the bus, that goes to Baton Rouge. And he says, hey, listen, if you ever need loft insulation, Harry Price, the guy to go to, here's my card. And this mysterious stranger says, ha, I'm not gonna need your card. And the salesman, Harry says, hey, listen, you never know. And then you focus on this mysterious stranger, he says, I know. He goes, I know that 12 years ago, you crashed your car while drunk. You came out of it okay. Your wife's been confined to a wheelchair ever since. I also know that you have five girlfriends and you don't hide this from your wife, even though you know it caused her great pain. And then at the end, he says, and at 532 this evening, you will be impaled by a swordfish. There is nothing to be done. It is written, Selena has already decided not to buy the lawn furniture. So you see, I'm not going to need your car at all. And this guy's sweating and kind of shaking, freaked out by the counter. So what Alan Moore's done is, and, and I love the use of this, this white background. I mean, a lot of times you just don't draw all the background, maybe to save time or artistic style. But usually in the past, you would just see them color it like some blue or some color like the sky just to make it not look white. But here they left it all white, which to me is better because you focus more on what's actually drawn. So you establish that this guy has some ability and he says, okay, this, you're a piece of crap. And he says, then they already find out, you're an even bigger piece of crap. And then at 532, you're gonna die. Next page, mysterious stranger goes to a head shop and is looking and buys a couple of things. And then he goes to the hotel and it says the hotel wasn't the best, it was the most atmospheric. And the devil has checked in at noon. So already, you already have set up something going on here and it's gonna like drive the rest of the story. Then on page three, you have your splash page. And usually with the big two comics, especially back in the day, the first page was your splash page, unless it was Batman. And then pages two and three was a double page spread where it was Batman on a bat rope swinging through Gotham City or something. But here, page three is Swamp Thing. And it's underwater and I love how they make it look soft focus like if you're underwater there the fish that's closer looks sharper because it's closer but as things are further away they're more blurry and then you find that he's in the water him and abby are chilling out he, you know, he's goofing around he pulls her underwater and they're just like chilling out hanging out with each other and then they get out and she says wow you were there for 30 minutes you really don't have to breathe and he's like i never did 
It was just a habit, so I gave it up. And she, and then she says, how does it feel not to breathe? And he goes, you know, I never realized how much effort it took. And this is the thing that Alan Moore is going to do in this issue and other issues. Little by little, he's going to show you the capabilities and the, I guess, superpowers that the Swamp Thing has. But it's not going to be done in a clumsy way. It's just in a very subtle way. So you already know he doesn't have to breathe. Just a little thing. So they're just, the two of them are just hanging out. And you can tell that there's a bond between them. You can tell that she really cares about Alec Holland, the human being, but she still cares about the Swamp Thing, even though he's like not Alec Holland. And they're just really comfortable with each other. And then he says to her, listen, uh, Matt hasn't come back again. Matt Cable, her husband, she's like, well, things aren't that great, but maybe they'll be better once I start my new job. And again, Alan Moore does that th thing that I mentioned in a previous issue where it's like a loop where the almost the, the end of a sentence on one page, when you turn the page, forms the beginning of the sentence here. So she says, oh, well, you know, I, I had an interview yesterday at the Elysium Lawn Center for Autistic Children. And then there's a flashback about her interview. And I was really curious about this because in the 1980s, especially 84, you really didn't talk or hear much about autism. Um, now you do, but back then you didn't. And Alan Moore doesn't do things out of happenstance. There's a reason why he does things. So I was kind of curious, seeing this now in 2022, if it seemed authentic or if it seemed unreasonable, because he could have just said generic uh, home for disturbed children or something generic like that, but he specifically picked out autistic children. And, you know, just for a little disclosure here, I'm also interested because as an adult, I was diagnosed with, well, they call it Asperger's syndrome then. Now it's just, they would just say it's a spectrum disorder. So Asperger's syndrome is where you have some of the autistic um, characteristics, but usually you're very high functioning. You're very verbal, as you can tell. Um, so it's not like full blown autism where you're not able to communicate. And it's like, there's that wall that unfortunately some kids and some adults, they suffer from. So I was kind of curious just personally why I was interested. And I kind of wanted to mention that not for any sympathy or for any reason. It's just that I know that people have either have a spectrum disorder or know someone that's close to them that has a spectrum disorder. And I don't want to say, oh, I'm interested, but not tell why, because I don't want, honestly, I just don't want somebody to read that, hear that and say, oh, well, you know, and get think that I'm just making light of it. I'm not. This is very close to me. So she tells about her interview and she meets this character, Paul, who's going to be central to the story. And she says, hi, my name is Abigail. I go, spell it. So why don't you go spell? Spell Abigail. Paul needs to know if you can spell Abigail for him. And she's like, she spells it. He goes, right. He goes, I don't know if I like you too, witchy. I have to go now. I'm in a group. And she's interviewing with the director. And she says, Paul's been with us for three months. She goes, I want to show you some of his work. So she so many drawings. And I love how they draw them like the way a little kid would draw them. And it says, I'm Paul. I'm in a group. My group does spelling. It's very important to spell right away. The next painting is where he, next drawing is like, if you don't spell, you can't get a job and the monkey king will come and that's it. You're dead forever. So you have this weird monster thing. And then he talks about how Jesus tried to spell the spelling wrong. So Paul bit him so he wouldn't spell wrong. So the director is saying, listen, you know, when I came here, I was going to quit. It's about eight years ago. You know, what do you think? And Abigail's like, yeah, yeah, I'd like to join. You can tell that she wants to help people. She feels bad for these kids. She's a very caring heart. So now she's telling him, well, listen, I'm going to go. I got to go, go to my job. And she drives off and he's alone with his thoughts. And he's like, oh, you know, the autumn's coming. He's like, what is it that comes with the autumn? And side note, here's an old school Joe Kubert school of cartoon and graphic art ad. And you saw a lot of these back in the day. And here you have the first letters page for the Alan Moore run. And Karen Berger does an introduction. She introduces Steve Bissett, Alan Moore, everybody else kind of cool. So again, Alan Moore does this thing and this kind of behavior about spelling right and saying I'm in a group and that kind of regimented thing. 
that to me is part of the spectrum. So he wasn't characterized as crazy, but some of the symptoms he has could be under the spectrum. So now we cut back and Alan Moore does that great thing where he has multiple plot, subplots going and they all tie together. So you see this place is auction barn. So you know you're at auction. And this guy asks our mysterious stranger, hey, do you know if the lawn chairs are there? And he goes, oh, no, I don't. And he's like, eh, it doesn't matter. And he goes, you know, this stuff comes from a family that died. He goes, man and his wife both dead, kids in a loony bin, I hear. And then you realize, is this the kid that Paul that we were talking about? And he says, well, you know, next year, I'm going to do some real relaxing. My wife's bidding on the lawn chairs. And then he says, Mr. Corelli, or mysterious stranger tells him, next summer you'll be in jail for manslaughter. You see, Selena doesn't like the lawn chairs. Good day to you, sir. So you've already tied this thing about Selena not liking the lawn chairs that was mentioned in page one. And you're like, what is Selena and not liking lawn chairs to do with anything? And then he says, wait, how did you know that Selena was the name of, and he turned the page, my wife, Abby. So he does that thing where the end will be the end of this sentence is the beginning of this, of the dialogue here. Now, Alan Moore is just so good at this. I mean, and he does it when you have to turn the page. So he knows, okay, on this page, and you have to turn it over. So it makes you want to turn it over. It, it, he's just, he's just playing on, he's just working on another level. So she's like, look, I got to go to the center. And he's like jealous because she doesn't want to spend time with him. And he's annoyed with her at that, but you can tell that she's not feeling close to him and she's kind of scared of him. And she's not sure why, but she's scared of him. So after she leaves, he goes, get up. And all of a sudden he manifests that power that he was showing earlier, where he kind of like her clothes go up and they kind of like fill out like she's really there. And he goes, now get on your knees and apologize. And you see these weird creatures and this orange, yellow and red kind of color scheme. Just more foreshadowing, like something's up here. And then the next issue, Paul is just sitting there, like an autistic child. He's just sitting there staring and people would just look at him and say, oh, you know, he's not communicating. I wonder what's going on in his mind. And he's having the memory and he's seeing his parents and they bought a Ouija board and they're spelling out these weird random words that made no sense. So they do a one word, a second one, and then a third word. And then the third word, they're like, what is that smell? And this creature, which is the monkey king that Paul drew about, comes out, just really horrific looking, kills the wife. And the guy goes, oh, Jeremy, oh, Jenny, oh, God. And he screams. Because it's killed her, it's killing him. And then they show Paul upstairs in his bedroom, and you know, scared. And he's like, he hears everything. The screaming, the sound effect, the sound exactly like someone eating lettuce. And you know there's that crunchy sound of someone eating a lettuce, and you're thinking that's the crunchy sound of the of this creature like chewing on or eating these uh, the parents, like really disgusting and disturbing. And then this monkey king walks up and it all does is lick his hand. And he says, "That was the most disturbing thing of all," and he's crying because he's living this memory and just a little touch about how good this team is. You see how the father is dressed in this light green shirt. Okay. If you go back and you see the drawings that she drew, that Paul drew, excuse me, he drew this, the drawing he did, the monkey came ripping apart a guy. He's wearing a light green shirt. This is his father. It isn't Paul. It's his father. So this is a little attention to detail that you will really only notice unless you're paying really close attention or you're reading this for a second or third reading. Again, the, the, the craft here is just, the attention to detail is amazing. So now you know what really happened with this creature. You know that Paul's not making it up. He's not insane. He's not delusional. Something happened and this made his... Any latent autism he had, the stress made it worse. And then you cut to the auction where the husband says, I can't believe you bought this thing. And it's all wrapped up. He goes, the most awful thing it is. And she's like, just 
shut up. He goes, I don't even know if this is legal. She's like, why didn't you get the lawn chairs? And she says, because I didn't like the lawn chairs and it's my money. Now shut up. And again, we have that reinforcement of Selena doesn't like the lawn chairs. Here, Selena doesn't like the lawn chairs. And you're like, okay, so instead of buying the lawn chair, she bought this thing. Okay, so they drive off. And then you have an interlude where the swamp thing is sleeping. And he's in the swamp. And this art is just so amazing. I love like this half circle here and all the, you know, what's going on outside. But in his mind, he's having a nightmare. And he's reliving the explosion that Alec Holland went through and he's like sleepwalking you know like as, as he's running through the in, in, in his nightmare he's running he's actually like walking too and then he wakes up and then he says i remember remember what comes with the auto it's fear so there's this ongoing subtext of fear he he knows it's something about fear it's like the the fear of burning and that memory Paul's fear of spelling incorrectly and bringing back the monkey king. So fear is the subtext that's here. Next page, they show the mysterious stranger. And he's using the same Ouija board that his parents used. And he figures out, okay, it spelled an incantation that opened the portal to allow this thing into our world. And he's like, oh, there's a lot to be done. It's already half past five. Cut to... They're outside, and there's an analog clock, a big clock outside. It's 5.30, so it, it ties saying half past five. And this guy says, hey, I'm sorry about that. I'll just help you pick this up. And she's like, oh, not really. And then he's like, hey, you know, you don't sound like you're from around here. Maybe two strangers could need some company. And she and he's, he's hitting on her. And you, you look at it, and it's Harry Price, the salesman that we encountered here who has the girlfriends. And he's trying to hit on her. She's like, listen, I got to go. And she's like, hey, don't go off. He's like, hey, listen. Uh, he's, he's still trying to hit on her. She's like, look, get lost, okay? And he's like, okay, but if you really need someone, if you really need loft insulation, and then if you didn't realize it was Harry Price, now you do. You remember, oh, yeah, that's Harry Price. That's that sleazy salesman. And he's so intent on hitting on her that he doesn't realize that he's walking on the street. And you can tell it's the street because the the sewer grate is right here. There's a sidewalk. He's out in the street. And then all of a sudden you see cut to some, um, Selena and Bobby. And Selena goes, Bobby, for God's sake, look out. Because he's out in the street. And Bobby hits the brakes. This package breaks through its ropes. You have this frozen moment where everything's blurry except his face, and it says Harry Price, loft insulation. And then the thing that comes out of it is this ugly swordfish statue. And it says here, printed, made in England. It doesn't, shows you that Alan Moore really does have a sense of humor. And then it goes, chunk, and it impales him. Just like the mysterious stranger said it would happen. And if you notice... It just shows 5.30 here, and it's, he said at 5.32, so two minutes elapse, and he's impaled. Um, a lesser writer would have had some kind of analog clock or something that would have said 5.32 p.m., but Alan Moore does it real subtle here, where you know it's 5.30, and it's like two minutes before this guy dies. Then you have here, okay, everybody's shocked and horrified here. Okay, please, coming through. And then all of a sudden you see the police officer says, now, you said you had this thing tied on your roof? And just weird side note, this looks like Sting from the police from the early 80s. And she's horrified. She just saw some guy getting impaled. She's crying. She's walking away. And as she's walking, our mysterious stranger walks up to her and says, Mrs. Cable, may I walk with you a while? We have a lot to talk about. She's like, oh, really? Who the hell are you? And he laughs and goes, yeah, you have to forgive me. My name is Blood, Jason Blood. Now, Jason Blood is the human host of the character Etrigan the Demon, which was created in 1971 by Jack Kirby. But they don't do that yellow box saying, he's also the demon created by Jolton and Jack Kirby or something really cheesy. It's just... If you don't know who he is, and I didn't know who he was when I read this, it's like, 
who is this guy? But if you know the comic's history, then you know who it is. So, at the, so the final scene in this issue is Paul's by himself at night. The Monkey King arrives. It licks him. It feeds on fear. And you can see this long tear here. He's so scared he won't move. But there's crying coming out. And the Monkey King leaves him and just goes to the rooms. And he mentions at the age of four, Roberta accidentally smothered her infant brother with a polyethylene black bag, excuse me, that's why she's here. Goes to her and he's gonna go to all these kids who have some type of trauma or fear. And, you know, it's like this thing, there are many children, but the night is long and it is very hungry. And you can see it's licking its lips because there's so much fear there. And then the last panel is uh, Goya's painting, uh, the Sleep of Reason Brings from Monsters. So Alan Moore is now writing at a very unique level where there's all this foreshadowing that you don't know. Now when you read this, it makes total sense what's going to happen. But it just seems so random about being impaled by a swordfish that it really makes no sense. They've established more of Swamp Thing's capabilities. They've established more of the fact that Abigail and Matt are not getting along. They've introduced this new threat, which is a horror threat. You've also established that Matt Cable has strange, unusual powers and he's getting weirder. And now you've introduced this horrible creature and you know the backstory. Again, Alan Moore is just writing this comic at a different level. Steve Bissett, Stephen Bissett and John Tottleben are just doing amazing work. Tajana Wood is doing amazing coloring. And now with Karen Berger here, the shift to a horror book has been made. And now it's going to get just more elements of horror, more supernatural elements. So the first four issues are kind of like the warm-up lab. And this is when it starts getting into horror. And next issue, issue 26, will continue this story. It's a three-part story, three-issue story. And um, we'll see more events unfold. Thanks.